Good evening. My name is Christoph Straub and I'm the Senior Manager of Adult Learning here at TIFF. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to tonight's special event, Karina Longworth on Wait Till the Sun Shines Nelly. To begin, we would like to acknowledge that today's, tonight's event is taking place on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe and Huron-Wendat. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community. On behalf of TIFF, I'd like to thank our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal Paris and Visa, our major public supporters, the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario and the City of Toronto, and our Cinematech on uh, supporters, Ontario Creates, and the Canada Council for the Arts. Also, a thank you to TIFF's donors and members for supporting our charitable mission of bringing the power of film to life 365 days a year. Tonight, we're pleased to screen a 35 millimeter copy of Henry King's Wait Till the Sun Shines Nelly, and it's a beautiful print, so I think you're in for a real treat. Um, Karina Longworth will join us briefly to introduce the screening, and then afterwards, she will join us for an extended onstage conversation. And after the onstage conversation, she will be signing copies of her new book, Seduction, Sex, Lies, and Stardom in Howard Hughes' Hollywood. Copies of the book are available for sale at the concession stand just outside. Um, before we screen tonight's film, we are also proud to show you a brief video highlighting the many successes that we've been able to celebrate as part of Share Her Journey, our campaign that helps support women both in front of and behind the camera. To join the movement, visit shareherjourney.org. And now to our host for tonight. Natalie Atkinson is a columnist for the Globe and Mail and a member of the Toronto Film Critics Association. She's the creator and host of Designing the Movies, a monthly film series where art direction, costume, and production design are the lens for land analysis. As both a fashion and film critic, she is interested in the narrative of material, culture, and object-driven social history. And her work often explores art and design at the intersection of culture and commerce. Her writing has appeared in Fashion Magazine, Noir City, and Vulture, and she's a regular contributor to Zoomer Magazine. Please join me in welcoming Natalie Atkinson. Good evening. Um, I'm going to be brief because you'll be seeing some of both of us after the film. I want to introduce Karina Longworth. I, you, you all are here because you know her and her, her work well, I'm sure. She's the creator, writer, and host of You Must Remember This, a popular podcast that explores the secret and or forgotten history of 20th century Hollywood. Since launching in 2014, You Must Remember This turned a contemporary and often feminist lens on topics ranging from the Manson murders and the blacklist to Joan Crawford's rise and fall to the parallel careers of Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi. A former film editor at LA Weekly and a critic for The Village Voice, she's the author of four books, including Meryl Streep, Anatomy of an Actor, and Hollywood Frame by Frame. Tonight, she's here about her new book, Seduction, Sex, Lies, and Stardom in, Ho in Howard Hughes' Hollywood. Um, she's going to tell you a little bit about the movie now. Please welcome Karina Longworth. Hi, everybody. So my new book is um, about 10 actresses who are involved with Howard Hughes, personally or professionally or both. And one of them is the star of tonight's film, Jean Peters, who married Howard Hughes in 1957 and remained married to him until 1971, although they had a very unconventional marriage and actually didn't see each other for stretches of months and even years. Jean came to Hollywood after winning a beauty contest, the prize of which was a contract at 20th Century Fox. Because Howard Hughes had spies all over town, he became aware of Jean before they ever met. And some people believe that he maneuvered to make sure she maintained under contract, sure she remained under contract at Fox for over a decade, even though neither the studio nor the actress herself seemed all that invested in her own stardom. Peters met Hughes the day before he flew an experimental plane that he had designed on a test flight and crashed that plane into a Beverly Hills neighborhood and nearly died. The pair became close while Hughes was recovering, and during that period, he was in a philosophical mood. He shared with Jean some of his most intimate thoughts about his past and his hopes for the future. By the time she left L.A. for the location shoot of her first movie, Captain from Castile, Hughes was talking about changing his will to make sure Jean was taken care of. She believed that this meant that she and Hughes were bonded to one another for life, and that their inevitable marriage would be just a formality. 
But Hughes would make excuses as to why he could not marry Jean until 1954, when she got tired of waiting and absorbing his lies, and she married someone else. While dating Jean, and in her mind stringing her along, Hughes was involved with many other women, including actress Terry Moore, who would later claim she and Hughes were secretly married on a boat in 1949, and never divorced. Jean's marriage to that other guy lasted about a month, and in 1957 she and Hughes finally eloped. But from the very beginning, he lied to her constantly about things like where they would live and his plans for their future together. For a large portion of their marriage, Howard Hughes spent no physical time with his wife, but made sure she was essentially sequestered in either a mansion or a hotel room where Hughes's employees could keep an eye on her and report back to him. He even had specific instructions for the kitchen at the Beverly Hills Hotel regarding what Jean was and was not allowed to order from room service. Jean made wait till the sunshine's Nellie five years before she married Hughes, but as we'll see tonight, the film eerily prefigured some aspects of her future marriage. I think she gives her most interesting performance in this film, as a woman who is trapped in a life designed and controlled by a husband who has been duplicitous and manipulative from the start. I can't say too much more about this movie without giving away the plot, which I don't want to do. There's a twist in the film which I didn't see coming when I first saw it and which left my jaw hanging open. I think often we watch mid-century Hollywood melodramas and we think we know the formula on which they're based and we think we know more or less what's going to happen. But this movie kept taking turns that I didn't expect and hopefully you won't either. One last note. Wait Till the Sunshine's Nelly is the first movie David Lynch remembers seeing. He is told a story about waking up in his parents' car at the drive-in while it was playing and never forgetting that experience. I'm not going to say that Wait Till the Sunshine's Nelly is a movie David Lynch would have or could have made, but you can definitely see its influence on, its, on his psyche in sort of ghostly ways. It's ultimately a movie about the darkness and falseness running through the American dream and lying just under the surface of the supposedly idyllic American small town. It takes place just outside of Chicago and not in the Pacific Northwest, and there's nothing supernatural in it, but otherwise it's sort of Twin Peaks the prequel. <laughs> Enjoy. We'll see you after. Um, I'd like to welcome to the stage Karina Longworth to talk a little bit about what the flavor of her book, Seduction. Now that you've seen it, you, you understand there were some spoilers involved. <laughs> um, now, in, in the book and in elsewhere, you talk about how you know, 40, the 45 minutes, which is roughly how long she's, Jean Peters is in the film, the movie is, is quite sympathetic with her. Would that have been unusual at the time, in the early 50s? Well, yes and no. I mean, I think that there were other films that were about a female experience. But when I first saw this movie and she goes off on the train, I thought that, you know, based on what I had been sort of uh, practiced in understanding about movies like this, is that she'd, you know, go off with this other guy, they'd go to Chicago, maybe something would go wrong there, and then she'd realize that she had to go back to her husband in the small town. I did not expect her to die in a horrible train wreck, and then for the movie to focus on her bad husband and, yeah. <laughs> and everything that happened to him for another 40 years. Right. And then his son gets murdered, but it's okay because his granddaughter looks just like his wife. Yeah. I mean, and the city, the, the, the idea that the city is bad. I mean, basically, yeah. the consequence for wanting yeah. the city is bad. And, yeah, and, it, and also just like the, the city, when the city comes to the small town, like only horrible things happen. Right, that whole, ga we came in right at the demented <laughs> gangster scene, which was a whole other thing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, keeping in mind that this is, bef this it sort of, you, you said it, anticipates what her marriage would have been like to Howard Hughes later. To some extent, obviously. I mean, obviously the circumstances were different, but um, but with Howard Hughes, it's almost more tragic because he has everything that money can buy. Um, he's not a small business owner who's you know whose only ambition is to just be like this, you know, to provide services to the truly powerful people in the town and to like control this little fiefdom. Like he has everything; he can give her anything, and yet he puts these arbitrary rules on her about you have to stay at the hotel, we can't live in a house, 
you can't order pork from room service. Et policing, policing pretty much at any kind of agency she would have perhaps had. Yeah. Which brings us to Howard Hughes, which is the framework for your book. Um, we, but it's about sort of a, por a group portrait of these 10, 10 different women personally and professionally involved with him. What made Howard Hughes the right way into that story for you about women in Hollywood and classical Hollywood? Well, I, it all kind of started years ago when I came across a message board where somebody had just made a posting that was w like women Howard Hughes had sex with. And it was just a list. And they were mostly actresses. And I think Gloria Vanderbilt was also on there. Um, but it was mostly actresses and no other information. And I just saw that list and I was like, wow, each of those women has a full life. And Howard Hughes was probably just a small part of it. And then as I got to know more about some of those women, it was just really interesting to me the different ways in which these women had lives before they met him. He came into their lives and impacted them personally or professionally or both. And then they had lives that continued on after him because he would disappear from their lives. And, and, and a number of them at the same time. And I guess maybe we should clarify for the audience who may not know how the contract or the studio system worked. And that'll, that'll, one of his methods of collecting, say, was that. Do you want to sort of sure. in a thumbnail um, way? So he was not unique in signing actresses that he was sort of sexually interested in, in, interested in to studio contract. That This was one facet of how the studio system worked. Almost every actor or actress who worked in Hollywood movies from the late 20s until the late 30s, but the practice continued throughout the 50s. But for definitely about a 10 year period, you could only act in movies if you were under a studio contract. And a lot of women would get signed to what was called a six month option contract, where they were guaranteed employment for six months, usually at a very low weekly salary. And the reason why they were given this contract was because some executive wanted to go to bed with them or like an executive, one, one executive wanted to go to bed with them and then there was sort of a plan to share this woman amongst multiple people. Um, Lana Turner talks about this in her autobiography. Ava Gardner has talked about this in her autobiography and other places, um, especially at MGM. And also at, um, it was slightly different at, the, at these other studios, but at MGM, Columbia, and Fox, we know this happened. Um, and one of the reasons why the actresses were paid so little was so that they would be so financially pressed that men would be able to come into their lives and, and basically create these sort of sugar daddy relationships. What were some of the mechanics for you researching the women around him and, and Howard Hughes himself? I mean, there hasn't been a big biography of him in over 20 years, but this is not a biography of Howard Hughes. No, so. but I mean, definitely one of the most useful treasure troves of information for me were these files at the State House in Austin, Texas, that were collected um, after Howard Hughes died. He didn't leave behind a, a recent will. And so three different states were fighting over who got to tax him. And um, a number of different people came out of the woodwork claiming to be his legitimate heirs. So a huge number of documents were amassed, mostly to try to figure out where, what would have been his state of domicile. And these documents all exist now in Austin, Texas. And it's stuff like medical records dating back to the 20s, telegrams from the 1930s, um, the memos that he sent in between his aides. Um, for a long time, he kept what he called operations, which was an office in Hollywood where the, if you wanted to get in touch with Howard Hughes, you'd call into operations and leave a message. And there would be secretaries who would transcribe everything you said and deliver that message to Howard Hughes. And then Howard Hughes would then leave a message to the secretaries. So there are logs of these calls in Austin, Texas. Uh and what you write is so fascinating is that it's not just the raw material of the calls. It's, you know, they were trained to, to sort of take down inflection mm -hmm. and a sense of mood from the call. Yeah, too. like like, it, like if, <laughs> if like an, an actress was delivered a message, the secretary was supposed to basically infer from her voice how she felt about that message. Um, and the, also the other thing that is really interesting that's in those files are depositions of a bunch of people who testified about Howard Hughes after his death. So there are a, a number of, of women and, you know, some of the, like we've got, there's Jean Harlow, there's Catherine Hepburn. Ava Gardner talks about the, the way in, 
in the book, you talk about how Ava Gardner talks about the way this sort of contract system was exploited and weaponized by Hughes. I mean, he's maybe the most extreme example, but he mm -hmm. was by far, far from the, the, the biggest yeah. to do this, right? Yeah, absolutely. So the women could be kind of penalized for not, in a way that men weren't actresses, they penalized for not performing in certain movies or punished, I guess. Well, I mean, actors would be too. An actor would be put on suspension if he was too difficult or if he like said no to too many projects. Um, but it does seem like it happened more to the most powerful female stars. Like Betty Davis was on suspension all the time just for not wanting to be in movies. And one thing that I write about in the book is that at Warner Brothers, when Betty Davis would refuse to do a script, they needed some actress to be in this movie because they still had to make the movie because they had to make a certain number of movies every week, every month, every year, because that's what their economics were based on. And so that's how Ida Lupino worked at, at Warner Brothers. She was like the second Betty Davis. And so she made a bunch of film noirs that are really good and really hold up. But those are all movies where if Warner Brothers had had their first choice, they would have been Betty Davis movies. And her trajectory is really painted out because that's not how she arrived. That's not how she was positioned when she arrived in Hollywood. No, correct? that's kind of like her mid-career. She first came to Hollywood from England as a bleached blonde 15 year old. And she was hired by Paramount to be their answer to Jean Harlow. Jean Harlow was the first blonde bombshell star. And at that time, she was under contract to MGM. She was making a lot of sort of sexy comedies. And every other studio was like, we need to get a blonde. <laughs> and Paramount decided their blonde should be this 15-year-old English girl. Well, there, so you, your previous work was as a, you know, I don't say previous, but like film criticism and journalism, film studies really inform the analysis that you make about the, the, the as a historian now. How are those... Complementary, and I'm thinking in particular of maybe the insight in the book that's about the outlaw and and Jane Russell and 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 sort of looking at the publicity campaign information around the film. Right. Um, well, to me, it's just never really made sense to like leave a tool in the box. I've, it just makes sense to me. Like, if I can do film criticism and I can do research, I should put the two things together. So in journalism, they don't often let you do that. Like if you're writing a film review, it's a review. And if you're writing an interview, it's an interview. And if you're writing a profile of somebody, that's not a film review. And so you're supposed to keep certain types of writing out of it. But, you know, I'd, I'd like to combine them. So when I'm writing about what you're talking about in terms of the way that I write about the outlaw in the book is that um, there's a scene in the outlaw in which Jane Russell's character gets raped by Bill, the Billy the Kid character. And it's it's in... Uh, a barn in a stack of hay. And the actual act happens behind these bales of hay, but you can hear what they're saying to each other and it's very evident what's happening. Um, the Outlaw was released for about a month in San Francisco in 1943, but it wasn't released nationwide until about 1946. Um, and so from 1940, when they first started, started shooting the film until 1946, Howard Hughes was blanketing the country with publicity about the movie. And from about, I think 1941 is when the first photograph was taken. Um, there was, there's a very famous photograph, which is in my book and which if you've seen a photograph of Jane Russell, you've probably seen this photograph um, of her sort of scantily clad, scowling, lying on a bale of hay. So this was put out there in the public about five years before anybody ever saw this movie and understood that a bale of hay was the setting for the film's rape scene. And it was put in the public for years and years and years before anybody saw the movie so that people would have in their minds this idea of like this sexy woman in a bale of hay and it sort of like subconsciously sexualizes the rape scene. As a kind of like this sort of fetish of non-consexual yeah. uh, experience. Um, how do you reconcile reading a lot of the, you know, sec secondary and now doing so much primary research, often um, contradictory sources or, you know, thinking about the veracity of a source as you're going along? Well, when I find contradictory sources, I, that if I don't know what the actual truth is, I just try to present the different versions of the story. And then usually I'll give my analysis as to what seems the most likely to be true based on what I know about the different situations, the different people involved, and just like common sense. So were there any big discoveries that we, we were chatting a little bit? There was a couple of big discoveries that I think that you made. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, the biggest thing for me, the thing where I, I feel like I'm breaking news in the book, and it was the biggest surprise to me in the research by far, is that Ida Lupino's FBI file reveals that she, um, so Ida Lupino presented herself as a New Deal Democrat. Um, there's a very good, bi otherwise very good biography about her that claims that she um, interfered with the FBI to save people from being blacklisted, that she was anti the blacklist and anti McCarthy. And her FBI file shows that she volunteered information to the FBI that helped people get blacklisted. So those are things that are very difficult to reconcile. Um, I don't know why the FBI would have these reports if it didn't happen. They do not include in their reports these things that have appeared in previous biographies about her helping people to not be blacklisted. That doesn't mean that those files were never created, but it, the FBI doesn't is not providing those now. Is not making them available. Yeah. What, what is the, I mean, there, there is so much in the, in the zeitgeist right now about old Hollywood and classical Hollywood, especially, you know, Filmstruck has really helped. We don't have it here, but it's in the US and we, no one's gonna have it soon. Um, that's a whole other story. But there is so much in the air and interest, and, but there's a lot of misinformation. So why is it important for you to go back to these primary sources and tread that ground? Well, I just, I mean, I think that if the documents are available, why not look at them? And yet people don't sort of seem to as much as you do. <laughs> I think people, well, I mean, I, it, it is very time consuming. Certainly at, at a number of the different archival locations that I went to, I mean, you usually you're traveling away from home. You only have so many days. You have to work every hour that the archive is open and you have to make decisions about what to look at and what not to look at. Other, because there's just no way to look at everything. So it's not easy, but it's also like, I didn't get in, I didn't need to get any special permission to look at almost every file that I reference in the book. Like anybody could look at this stuff. It's just that people have jobs that are not my job, so. You're the only one with your job <laughs> right now. I mean, you know, period. Um, are there things as you've, you know, you've been doing the podcast for four and a half, four-ish years? Yeah. And, you know, over 100 and almost 150 or something episodes. Are there, you know, as you read the bibliographies or read the, the books, for one thing, are there little things that have come back and you wish you could go back and add in or little tidbits of information that change your analysis of previous stories? Sure, a little bit. I mean, certainly, like, I, I did an episode about Ida Lupino in 2014, and I had not looked at her FBI files. So if I made that episode today, it would include that information. Um, that's, I mean, that's the biggest example I can think of off the top of my head. But certainly, like, at, as time goes on, people are finding out new things. And, you know, I'll discover that there was a book that I probably should have read two or three years ago that I didn't even know about and things like that. Are there um, rabbit holes you've gone down for the podcast as a series that you've abandoned or you've shelved for the time being for whatever reason? There's only really one. And I, I started doing the research for a podcast season and I abandoned it. Um, this was, I think, in early 2017. I wanted to do a series about the three main actors in Rebel Without a Cause, uh, Natalie Wood, Sal Mineo, and James Dean, who all died before their times. And mysterious and tragic ways. Um, but unfortunately, I found that I, I just, I, I looked at every James Dean biography I could find, and I didn't feel like any of them were really substantive. substantive. Um, so I don't know. I'm, I'm still, still looking for a way to do that series. Is there, um, I mean, like, this is not a, a biography of, of Howard Hughes, and it's a really interesting prismatic look at the, the lives of these women, but you've spent a lot of time kind of in Howard Hughes's head and in his logs. And there hasn't been a biography of him since, and I've heard you talk about this a little bit, since we kind of understood, you know, undiagnosed mental illness or, you know, the head injuries. Like, you make the point that they met, what is it, a day before that big crash? He met, he met Jean Peters the day before his crash in 1946, where he was flying an experimental plane that he had invented for use in World War II, but obviously it was not finished in time for use in World War II. He was still tinkering with it. This was his first major test flight, and he crashed it into a Beverly Hills neighborhood, and he should have died. And he miraculously survived, but he was never the same. Is there any way we can look at him? I mean, he, he was like, make no mistake, kind of control and power crazy and but is there any way that we can look at him sympathetically I mean do you have any sympathy or empathy 
for him I, as a figure? I do, but not really because of the head 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 <laughs> head, head injuries. Okay. Um, the two areas in which I have empathy for him, one is not flattering to me, um, but I I I recognize parts of myself that I don't like in his. Um, his tendency to both kind of chase fame and run away from real people, like wanting to be recognized, but also not really wanting people to know who you really are. Um, I, I struggle with that for sure. And I wish I was different. <laughs> and then the other thing that I, um, I empathize with is just the fact that he died alone with nobody there who wasn't paid to be there. And just as a human being, that feels very sad to me. This, this sort of idea of him being at a remove, I mean, there's so much ca cataloged and factual and yet, as you say, kind of unknowable. We live, at, I mean, there's, there's a lot of temptation to make direct parallels to these stories and, and sort of the power structures at the time with today, especially in the recent year or so. Um, but that's sort of a false equivalency, right? Like you. Well, I think so. I mean, I understand why people do want to say Harvey Weinstein belongs in this trajectory of moguls who also abuse their power with women. But first of all, I think that the studio system is impossible to compare to Harvey Weinstein's 90s and certainly to today because economically it was structured so differently, um, the power structure was different, and also the influence of Hollywood was so different in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s than it was in the 90s or today. Um, it, I mean, Amer like the American century of the 20th century is also the Hollywood century. Um, but that cultural power was already very much waning by the time that uh, Harvey Weinstein was at the peak of his powers in the mid 90s. Um, the other thing is that I just feel like if you're going to call Harvey Weinstein like a Louis B. Mayer or a Howard Hughes type, you're canonizing him like within this group of like, quote unquote, great men. And I just feel like that cheapens the experience of his of his victims. Well, we live in this time where we think we, like there, there's a there's a way in which we're kind of arrogant, and think we live in this time of uh, clarity and we know what's going on. And because cause a lot of what's intriguing about your book is also analyzing the way s messaging and spin of narratives. And we seem to think that because we know that we're being spun to, we're still not we're not susceptible um, today. And I wonder what you think about that kind of truth and transparency today. I mean, my big question is, are we going to live long enough to really know what happens with, like, what's the real Tom Cruise story in 25 years? Right. Like, the way we do, like, you know, Howard Hughes has been dead for over 40 now. We're right. only just getting kind of pieces of it. I mean, from what I see in popular culture today, um, the things that are supposedly transparent, like famous people's Instagram stories, obviously, they're shaping versions of their life for public consumption. Um, and so I just, I don't think it's, I don't think it's true transparency. And for the most part, no famous person has any incentive to tell the truth about anything because there's no investigative journalism. So nobody's going to find out. Um, but it is possible that, you know, when Tom Cruise dies, um, that people, some people will come forward and, and tell true things. And, and then we can have a conversation about whether or not they're exploiting him or they're cashing in on their relationship to him. We'll see. Are there, I mean, you spend time at the, is it the Herrick, the, 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 the Academy Library? In Los library? Angeles, in Beverly Hills, the Academy has a library called the Margaret Herrick, yeah. Do you have a sense of whether the current kind of celebrity firmament and filmmaker community is leaving papers there? Do you, like, is that, is that yeah, continuing? I mean, there, there are not, a, as far as I can tell, there's not a lot of like, you know, complete files left by people who are still alive, but I, I don't think that's abnormal. No. But you know, I mean, th I mean, there are people who leave their collections places, like Woody Allen has a collection at, at an East Coast University, Robert De Niro's papers are at the, the Ransom Center in Austin. Mm -hmm. I mean, people do do it. There's, um, uh, you know, one of the many over, like themes that run through the, the lives of these women and Howard Hughes's and the Hollywood's relationship to these women is the way in which women's bodies are used to sell and make films in kind of not just literally on the screen but in every way and at the beginning of this year there was the, the, at the, the first sort of post Weinstein public gathering red carpet there was this um, sort of blackout like every, all the women opted to wear black as sort of a signifier 
Um, I'm wondering where you, you stand on that idea of sort of the, the giving up the glamour as a labor, like as a secondary labor these, these actresses were doing. Nobody gave up glamour. People, <laughs> well, okay, no, people they look didn't. fantastic in black. Are you kidding me? It's like black. the most flattering color. I remember having to write about it, and it was like, black is really hard to photograph, and it doesn't show detail, and so they're all really, you know, taking a bullet. Oh, they're all taking a, a bullet. What a sacrifice. I don't know. I, I can't say that I feel like it, that felt like meaningful activism to me, no. But there is a way in which that's, you know, the idea of boycotting a red carpet, that's a really important boycotting economy. Boycotting a red carpet, yeah. sure. Like, actually not being photographed. If, if every actress was like, we're not going to even walk the red carpet. But they wouldn't be able to get away with that because they have... They, in a lot of them have in their you know they're not under studio contracts but they're under contracts to make individual movies and their promotional requirements in those contracts do you but but they're also paid less than their male counterparts and so there's this sort of secondary economy that happens right whether they yeah but like Ch chanel can give you a black dress as easily as they can give you a white, a white dress one, yeah <laughs> um the past few weeks, uh, like I said, like TCM and Criterion's announced the end of their streaming service, Filmstruck, their their joint venture, and you know there's been a lot of outcry in the last week, especially because it ends at the end of November, about the availability of a lot of these films, and and even reading the book, you talk about how hard it was for you to see some of these these films. Why is the archival life of those movies important to the work of the film historian too? Well, I mean, I just think of it the same way I think of books or art. Um, you know, maybe not every Gene Peters movie is important. You know, maybe not every Faith Domerg movie is important. But once you start making judgments about which movies are important and which ones aren't, then like you're just eating away at film history. And it's it's all important. It's all, you know, these are all bodies of work. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I if I had my choice, everything would be available. You know, I mean. Yeah, I just I th I think that I think that the industry should have done a better job preserving things going back to its beginning, and unfortunately they did it. And now a, a, a giant proportion of silent films are lost. And every time we switch formats, some movies get lost. So it's it's really sad. And I, I mean, nobody's going to do it if the studios don't do it. Am I getting the que is it question time now? Okay, so I th we're going to open the floor to questions. Sorry, I didn't mean to. No, no, no problem. Problem, but I'm getting like a, a swipe. So could you please, if you have a question, go to the microphone and we've got 10 or 15 minutes. So please get some in. And... Is there someone there? Anyone? No? Do you want me to? I have others. I have more. Oh, the, the woman in the middle there. The mic will come to you. Hi, uh, love the podcast, and I was Thank just you. curious about where do you come up with the ideas for the series that you do, and roughly how long does it take in terms of research to put that together? Well, when I first started, um, I had a list of ideas, and now that's long gone. And so I, um, uh, you know, they just kind of come out of thin air to be honest. And like, I, I've really tried to not make podcast seasons until I have an idea. That's not always possible. I mean, the, I was under contract to make these Hollywood Babylon episodes and I just had to do something. And so I, I forced myself to get an idea, but it, I would prefer for there to be, you know, if it takes me a year to get an idea, I'd prefer to wait a year until I have a really good idea. Um, but when I, when I do find an idea, um, I usually spend about a month planning out what the episodes are going to be to find out, figure out how many episodes there are and what the sort of basic summary of them is. And then each individual episode can take anywhere from one week to four weeks to write and research, kind of depending on how much information is out there, how many movies I feel like I need to watch in order to really understand the subject. Um, and then the recording is the fastest part. The recording takes an hour and a half, and then I give the file to somebody else to edit. And the turnaround on that is less than a week. Oh, yeah. there, there's over here? OK. There's oh, yeah. someone in the third row right here with a question. Uh, somebody oh. has a microphone okay, right here. OK, sorry. I'm, yeah. Oh, I you can't mentioned see you. <laughs> Hollywood Babylon. I'm wondering if Kenneth Hanger is on your radar, because he wrote, you know, a bit, there's a bit of overlap. And he lived through it, too, and obviously also had a career as, as an avant-garde filmmaker. but. 
see someone you've met or he's on your radar or, or how you would compare yourself to him? He's not a historian, but he, you know, he was a child actor and, and came uh-huh. by it in a different way. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if you know, I've done a, a podcast season where I, I call it fact-checking Hollywood Babylon. So I've, I've been doing these podcast episodes about Hollywood Babylon. So he's definitely on my radar, but I've never met him or spoken to him. Um, what do you think about the, the um, Scotty Bowers memoir and, and this whole um, revelation of the supposed or real homosexual undercurrent in Hollywood, that this history that's now starting to come out? Have you come across anything in any of your research about that? I write about that actually in this book a little bit um, within the context of Katherine Hepburn. So I feel like I couldn't be more articulate speaking to you than I am in the book. Um, it's interesting. I'll ask while they go up there. I have a question. You get a lot of listener feedback. What on your website and social channels? What's one of the most requested areas um, that that they want future coverage from? Like people or themes? The Black Dahlia. Oh. If anybody comes up with a new angle on that, let me know. <laughs> uh, yeah, up there. Um, hi, love the podcast. Thank you. Um, you, uh, when you're doing a series, something like Hollywood Babylon or um, any of the other ones where you have multiple episodes that are connected but are kind of individual silos of information, do you prefer to work on one episode and drill down into that until it's complete? Or do you like to hop around and do little bits of each one and come back and do a second layer and a third layer? It really depends. I mean, on Hollywood Babylon, I, I've been um, writing full episodes before moving on to the next. Um, but for something like Boris and Bela and Boris or Jean and Jane, you know, if you're reading one book, there's information that you're getting in that book that can apply to multiple episodes. So I'll often be writing like four or five episodes at once. Thanks. Over here. Hi. Um, I have a friend who's wondering uh, what you feel the future of film history will look like, considering uh, the changing technological landscape, specifically in the context of film, how film historians do what they do and how that affects what you do with your podcast. Well, I mean, I consider myself a film historian, um, but I don't, I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball, and I don't really like to predict the future. I just hope I can continue to work. Sorry, I know that's not satisfying. I just, I really don't like predict- predicting the future. There's another Hi. Right here. Oh. Um, I'm curious, what um, is it about this particular for- performance from Jean Peters, and what can we glean from this film or this performance, especially since you chose it for a reason? And I'm curious, <laughs> we've talked about the weird, um, the deceit, and the strangeness behavior of her husband. Like, what is that, like, the act of defiance of going to the city? Like, how should we, I guess, read this film? (laughs) Well, I think that's two different questions, but in terms of her performance, what I find interesting about it is how raw it is and how it it connects to no form of acting that was on screen at the time. It's, It's not, like, Hollywood studio acting. It's not method acting. It just feels like she's being a real person in ways that are sometimes ugly and don't make sense. And so I find that fascinating. And um, I guess, I mean, just the takeaways of it, I mean, I, I, I just, it's not an easy film to summarize or to understand in a lot of ways. Um, but I just, I find its messiness fascinating. And and the look of it is just, I mean, especially this print, you guys are so lucky that you got to see it on this print. It's The colors are so intense. And it just, it feels like this kind of Baroque exaggeration of 1950s Technicolor cinema um, in a way that I just find so fascinating. Hi, uh, big, big fan of the podcast. Thanks, Thanks very much. I'm actually on my second time around going through it and <laughs> uh, listening to everything in much more detail. And I'm noticing that there's so much material in your podcast, and it's just amazing, so I appreciate that. And there are just little tidbits here and there that come up. 
like for example, that your podcast on Charlie Chaplin, and you say, "Oh, that's a whole other show," or <laughs> William Randolph Hearst, "That's a whole other show." Do you ever go back and listen to your own podcast and then decide, "I got to do that next show"? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I I do know that I've said that a few times, and I think I have done a couple of "That's a whole other show." I've actually done the show, um, but the one that um, the one that's like really outstanding, I feel like that I would would probably. It would be my first choice to go back to is that um, in the Manson series, I talk about the movie performance and I'd, I would really like to go back and talk about that. All right. Any more questions before we adjourn to the signing? OK, one one more here. Hi there, um, long time listener. Um, love it, thank you. Thank you. Um, your podcast helped me get so much more into old Hollywood movies and um, I, I just wanna know if there was any personal recommendations of uh, old Hollywood movies that have a focus on mental health or addiction that might be cool. Oh wow, that's difficult to come up with off the top of my head. Um, is somebody suggesting something out here? The Snake Pit. That's an interesting one. Snake Pit? Lost Weekend. Good. Yeah. <laughs> you should crowdsource <laughs> okay. amongst these guys. Um, you know, I mean, the first thing that came to my mind is Shock Corridor, but oh. it's a little lurid. <laughs> but it's James Wong Howe. Uh -huh. That's an, it's yeah, true. So good. Um, if there are no more questions, if you just uh, give... Karina, a couple of minutes to get settled. Just outside the door, there's a table at the end, and she'll be signing books and chatting um, after the after you all uh, exit the cinema. Thank you so much, Karina Longworth, for Thank being you, in Toronto. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you.